This guy's popularity is a result of YouTube. I mean, come on, you don't get millions of views worth of free advertising and gain nothing from it. And that's not to discredit creator Scott Coffin or FNAF. No amount of advertising is going to make a star out of a poorly made game, but the reality is that YouTube has a lot of power now, and the games industry has realized that. Especially the indie scene. There is a genre of games that I affectionately call the YouTube Indie Darlings. Games that spread across YouTube and get millions of views and dedicated communities. Undertale, Doki Doki Literature Club, Among Us. These are all games that started out as small indie titles that blew up to huge superstardom with the power of YouTube. The emergence of these indie darlings has caused a shift in game design, because like every other art medium, games are influenced by trends. And no genre has been as influenced by the YouTube content train like horror games. There are a lot of theories I can come up with for why horror games fall victim to this trend more than other genres. Maybe it's the emotive aspect of a let's play that really synergizes with the uncomfortable vibes and jump scares. Maybe it's the fact that horror games tend to be shorter or separated into natural chapters that translate well into separate videos. Maybe it's the ability for horror games to utilize lower quality graphics as an asset rather than a hindrance, making them easier to record on lower quality computers. Maybe it's a little of all of the above. But I don't want to ask why horror games have changed. I want to look at how they've changed. What's happening to the indie horror darlings of YouTube? And there is no better way to start than at the beginning. But first, a disclaimer. I'm about to spoil a couple games. I won't be going very deep into these game stories, but I will be discussing plot at a surface level. I am also basing this video mostly on observation, so do not take any of my conjectures as provable fact. I'm making conclusions based on the data available to me, and I tried to make statements in good faith, but I'm not perfect. Also, for monetary and sometimes ethical reasons, I have not played every game I'm going to talk about today, but I have experienced the content. For the sake of transparency, I will disclose when I have not personally played an entry in a series. Now, the beginning. Twenty-fourteen's Five Nights at Freddy's is now a behemoth of horror, but it started as an incredibly simple concept. Sit in a PNG office and resource manage until a Chuck E. Cheese reject screams in your face. The very definition of fear. But the act of sitting in one place, unable to hide and unable to fight, really did bring a new twist to a very stagnant genre. You had to wait and watch as these uncomfortable looking characters slowly made their way to you when you briefly looked away. That, combined with a clock constantly reminding you of how little time has passed and a power supply that's constantly shrinking, leads to a very interesting pressure situation that gives urgency to the gameplay despite not being able to move at all. And this worked incredibly well for Scott Cawthon. YouTubers had something cheap easily understood and highly reactive to give to their audience, which in turn led to a larger viewer base that would follow the series to new YouTubers and to the game itself. Soon enough, you couldn't find a Let's Player who hadn't tried the game. And we'd seen this with older titles like The Witch's House and Amnesia The Dark Descent, so this mixing of YouTube and game popularity wasn't unheard of. What was unheard of was Scott's next actions as a developer. And I truly believe this changed something in the indie horror genre forever. Scott released a sequel to his hit horror game just three months later. This is the start of a pattern you'll start to see a lot in this video. Being a trending game is nice, but trends come and go. They fade as audiences lose interest in the things they've already seen and instead move to the next big thing. YouTube audiences are no exception, moving from Amnesia, to Slender, to RPG Maker games, to FNAF. It is in our nature as viewers to look for something new and forget the old. But by releasing a new entry into his new series, Scott extended FNAF's shelf life on the trending tab. 
He brought something new for players to play and viewers to watch so that the audience would continue to think about and be invested in this new property. And a key factor in this phenomenon was FNAF's simple design. The game's limited capabilities and assets made it a very easy game to reproduce and upgrade, which is the only way it got out so quickly. I mean, ask any game developer to finish a game in three months, and they will probably look at you in a mixture of confusion and horror. But Scott Cawthon's little game that could, did, and boy did that invigorate his already growing community of fans and players. He gave everyone what they wanted, new animatronics, new gameplay, and most importantly of all, new lore. Was that the bite of 87? Hold up, hold up. We're not there yet, but don't worry, we'll get there. After FNAF 2's major success, a new title would release just four months later with new animatronics, new gameplay, and new lore. And just four months later, another FNAF would release with you guessed it, new animatronics, new gameplay, and new lore. Sister Location would be the next major installment, released over a year after FNAF 4, but the wait wouldn't matter. The die had already been cast. FNAF was now a series that had consumed the YouTube gaming community for an entire year, unrelenting in its popularity. It had settled in the collective zeitgeist of YouTube's audience and had defined itself as a staple of the horror genre. And I believe this prolonged barrage of new FNAF is what made it more than just a game. Because it was constantly around, because new content was being given to fans right before they lost interest, because it was a genuinely well put together series with intriguing twists and turns, FNAF was able to build into a franchise beyond just the games. Plushies, keychains, lunchbox, uh, slippers, underwear, hoodies, mugs and figures, cereal, mystery box, t-shirts, pens, Funko Pops, badges, Porygon, Hippochan! Sorry, I got a bit carried away. The point is that FNAF grew beyond a video game and became a franchise with power outside of the YouTube sphere it started in. Certainly, YouTube still was linked to the series, but now there were several book series and a movie on top of the several games that just kept coming. It had evolved into every developer's wet dream, a veritable money printing machine that had expanded from a single person passion project through the free advertising juggernaut of YouTube. And after seeing this success, it was inevitable that other developers would covet it even if it meant they had to pull their games apart to get it. Bendy and the Ink Machine's first chapter came out February of 2017, and you wouldn't immediately see the connection to FNAF at first glance. You have movement, you can hold items, you solve puzzles, and the world has a unique art style. It seems like a completely different genre, and it is, but it also holds some suspicious similarities to make me question the impact FNAF had on Bendy's initial development. First is the mascot and theme. While Chuck E. Cheese and Steamboat Willie aren't that similar beyond their child-friendly mouse mascots, they both are nostalgic child properties, and these horror games take that concept and turn a fictional mascot into a terrifying creature. Plus. Both these monsters are made from dead people. Second are the tapes. In FNAF, you have the phone guy giving you instructions to start each night. In Bendy, there are the tapes you find that tell you more of the backstory and what's going on. Both are recordings of a long gone employee of the company and come with a twinge of lore bait too, just enticing enough for YouTubers. A kind of common trope in horror, but still a similarity. Third is the release structure. Bendy and the Ink Machine was released in chapters, slowly and slowly sending out more and more content as they actually made it to keep fans enticed with this project. Sound familiar? Actually, it's a rather clever workaround to the much harder route of making four good games in a year. Now they only have to make one full game, but they don't even need to finish it before profiting. And let me be frank. None of this is definitive proof that the Meatly and Joey Drew Studios saw the success of FNAF and chose to copy parts of its formula to create another child-friendly horror series perfect for YouTube fame. But the timing is just right, and the similarities just happen to be the parts that made FNAF a smash hit, so it does make me suspicious. 
But beyond FNAF's influence on the title, there was YouTube's influence. Chapter 1 was met with great excitement and reviews. It was aesthetically interesting and unique, Bendy was a cute mascot, and the gameplay showed promise. Everyone was looking forward to the story and game that was about to play out. But there was a problem. The developers didn't have a story or game to share. In an interview, creator Mike Mood would admit that Bendy's development started with a beginning and an end, but no substance in the middle. You know, it was it was a complete accident. Um, you know, we, we'd like to say we knew exactly what was going to happen, but but really, at the end of the day, we knew the beginning and we knew the end of the game. Everything that happened in between was was kind of developed as we went along. Things kind of progressed and changed. Like a, an example would be in Chapter 2, we had a poster of Alice Angel, and that was just one poster off in the corner, whatever, and the fans just started doing fan art, and they just fell in love with the character, and really there was nothing explaining what this character was. Yeah. And at the time, we were getting ready to jump into Chapter 3, and it made it really obvious that Chapter 3 should be about Alice Angel. This is troubling, to say the least. Why would you put out a chapter for a game you haven't even thought out yet? How can you guarantee that this chapter would stay the same after the rest of the story is put together? How can any of those secret lore pits matter if you don't know your own story? But you know what happens two months later? Chapter 2 releases. And Chapter 3? Only five months later. Chapter 4 would take another 7, and then the final chapter would be released in October, six months after that. Another set of bite-sized releases to the same series that took a little over a year. And these chapters felt clearly rushed and haphazardly put together. At least in my opinion. From characters being added to the game simply because fans seem to be fond of the concept, to whole chapters becoming fetch quest simulators with little varying gameplay, it just didn't feel like the developers had a clear plan for what they wanted Bendy to be. Was it combat focused? Was it puzzle focused? Was it survival focused? No one part of the gameplay was used to its fullest potential, instead being an amalgamation of basic horror concepts thrown together when something was needed to fill the space between dialogue. And Chapter 5 cemented that for me because in the end, it was a buggy mess that ended in a poorly built battle with Bendy and an ending that basically told us we're either crazy and it was all a dream, or we died, or maybe we weren't even alive to start with. At least in FNAF, they had the decency to fire you properly. But honestly, who cares about the release schedule or the game quality? Because before they even released Chapter 3, they had a merch store. T-shirts, buttons, posters, stickers, headbands, rubber bands, vinyls, figures, plushies, bow ties, bacon soup, pillow, cutouts, lanyards, gyarados, slow bra! God dang it. So I want to say that Bendy is a decent game. That it isn't just a cash grab. But with an early release with little to no plans, a merch store up and running before the game was even halfway finished, and Chapter 5 releasing in a completely buggy state with a lackluster ending to a fairly basic and predictable story that, till this day, still hasn't really been fixed, it's hard to separate the parts that feel like a loving project versus the corporate shilling. It clearly saw dollar signs with the popularity of the first chapter on YouTube, and whatever carefully crafted experience we might have received was probably thrown out for whatever would keep the fans temporarily happy instead. And I would be remiss to leave out the poor treatment of workers at Kindly Beast, a now dissolved studio that had encompassed Joey Drew Studios, The Meatly, and more employees working on Bendy and other games. I will leave a link to a much more in-depth video by Chris Portal in the description, but the TLDW boils down to mismanagement, a mass firing before holiday season, and an unsurprising lack of direction for anyone regarding what they were even supposed to be making. This franchise has promise, and Bendy and the Dark Revival might come out as a more cohesive project since they are actually taking their time with it. But only time will tell if they can let go of the focus on merch and money to actually make a full game instead. To be fair though, they're still better than... You've heard about it. You've memed it. It was probably the most disappointing game of 2017. It's box stacking simula- I mean, hello neighbor. Now, I won't spend an hour talking about the decline of hello neighbor, because that's already been done. By this guy. 
in this video. Link is also in the description. However, Hello Neighbor provides a more explicit example of the change that indie horror games go through during development due to the influence of YouTube. Alpha 1 provided an interesting and unique concept that many creators and viewers liked, an AI that thwarts your endeavors to break into his house by learning from your previous attempts. And why were you breaking into this guy's house? Because you're a curious little twerp who can't mind their own business. Also, this guy's got something going on with his basement, but hey, this is his house. That's his business. What's it to you? And YouTube loved it. Every Let's Player under the sun got a Steam key to try this alpha, and pretty much everyone agreed that this was a fun concept that looked promising. A horror game that was also a breaking and entering game that would challenge you with puzzles and problem solving in an entirely new fashion. It got a lot of people excited to see where the game would go and how this AI would grow as development progressed. But then we started to see the same trends as our previous games. Alpha 1 released in October of 2016, and Alpha 2 would release one month later. Then another month for Alpha 3, and 5 for Alpha 4. Three betas would release periodically afterwards, until the final release date of December 8th, 2017. Another spaced out release of content to extend the game's popularity for about a year before releasing the final game. But by Alpha 4, many fans were starting to see the writing on the wall. Already the game had changed from a breaking and entering horror game to a puzzle solving platformer. But I hesitate to use the word puzzle because nothing was really made like a puzzle should be. Instead, choosing unorthodox places to hide key items to artificially extend the game's runtime. And again, there is just so much that went wrong gameplay-wise with this title, so I recommend watching those videos dedicated to it to get the full picture. My point is that this game showed signs of departure from its original core concepts early on, as soon as it had gained its YouTube audience. After that, the game started to change and ignore the biggest selling point, the neighbor's AI, and instead replaced it with cutscenes, minigames, and secret lore is about the lore of it. Stop. I said we'll get there. Just be patient. So overall, Hello Neighbor changed. Instead of focusing on improving what was already there, they spent their time adding more and more. Probably because YouTubers don't really make videos about games they've already played unless new content is released. And they needed that sweet YouTube free advertising to sell their merch. T-shirts, face masks, posters, plush cats, fungo pops, board games, action figures, desk masks, book series, TV series, pins, plush neighbor, clip on hangers, pillow face, dragon air, magmar! Can I make the observation that almost everything they sell now is Hello Neighbor 2 merchandise of characters that haven't even come out yet? Like, is no one else convinced they've jumped the gun? Just a bit? Anyone? Anyone? Just me. Okay, okay then. then. I'll just I'll start just the next, next section. section. Poppy. Poppy, Poppy, Poppy. I hate Poppy Playtime. Viscerally hate it. It's a clear attempt at cashing in on a gaming trend that's so easy to manipulate because the general audience is literal children. I mean, look at the quality gameplay here. This is peak effort. Hey, don't push me. Yeah, that's right, bitch. For Bendy and Hello Neighbor, I can forgive the greed because it at least seemed like they had been working on their respective games for quite a bit before falling into the new indie horror trends, and with the individuality of their concepts, I firmly believe they had been attempting to make a game before YouTube popularized them. But Poppy is so formulaically built for YouTube that it convinced me it had no other purpose other than to make money as the newest child-friendly horror franchise. And let me be fair. It is absolutely not a problem to monetize your art. I have no problems with the idea of merch, nor with spin-offs or sequels. If you can make money from your passions and hard work, that is your right. I certainly make money off of mine. But my issue with Poppy Playtime is that it only cares about money. It's a game about haunted children's toys created with the remains of dead humans, where you wander through an abandoned factory in chapters to find the secret lore of the area through basic puzzle solving. The only thing it brings to the table is extendo arms. That's it. It even starts the same as Bendy, with an invitation to come to the haunted place by a previous employee. 
It's got lore tapes. It's got something trying to eat you. It's got a convoluted location based more on puzzle solving rather than running from any enemy. It's just so basic. Is anyone even afraid of things made from humans anymore? Because I'm pretty much desensitized to the topic. In fact, the story is so basic that you can replace Toy Machine with Ink Machine and you would literally have Bendy's plot right down to the questionably good female monster that might be helping you run from the mindless mascot. The story has no flavor. But you know what Poppy does have? Merch! And this doesn't deserve a Pokey Wrap first because it's just shameful. Not even an hour's worth of gameplay is ready for players, but they were hard at work making a Huggy Wuggy plushie just in time for its surprising YouTube success. And merch takes time and is usually a gamble, especially for a studio that's never made a game before, so you can tell this wasn't a response to the popularity it garnered, this was the intended result. It's also interesting to note how the merch store button on the game's title screen just happened to show up after a majority of big name Let's Players had done their videos. Because we wouldn't want to alert our new fans to our real priorities too early, now would we? And if you don't believe me about mob games jumping the gun on their only gaming property, maybe the fact that they've already teamed up with Studio 71 to make a movie will. Wow, that was quick. And Mob Games is a studio that formed from YouTube channels Enchanted Mob and Sam Studios. Channels that focused on and found their audience in kids watching Minecraft animations with FNAF, Bendy, and other indie darling properties. These guys know how to manipulate a young audience. They've profited off of these horror trends. If anyone saw the money-making potential in throwing a dead human possessed nostalgic property at that young audience with only a coat of paint to differentiate it from the previous dead human possessed nostalgic properties they already had, it was these guys. Also, there may have been more explicit plagiarism. Another video link in the description if you'd like to learn more about that and mob games less than stellar history. Also, also, NFTs! I don't think I really need to defend this point. They made NFTs that contained lore for their 30 minute game demo for children. I don't care if they apologized, they knew exactly what they were doing. Poppy Playtime is a money making formula disguised as a game. It doesn't have a soul, not even one from a former employee. And it can get away with it all because the YouTube content machine doesn't care about intent. It cares about views. And as long as you've got the secret ingredient, anything you make could be the next big hit. That ingredient? Alright, let's finally get to it. Let's finally talk about lore. Lore in this context is background information about the game's world and plot. It's pretty standard in most games, from the history of the T-Virus in Resident Evil games to the prophecies that enable the heroes of Dragon Quest to save the world. Some games have next to none, and some have enough to fill an entire cyclopedia. But these indie horror games have figured out the secret to keeping their fans focused on their series and YouTubers focused on making more videos, and that's hiding the lore. Secret tapes, hidden puzzle games, nightmare sequences that are abstract and cryptic, strange phrases or wording from an NPC. This is what keeps players coming back for more. And that's very important to how these games become franchises. See, even with the delayed release schedule renewing interest in your game, the big name YouTubers are only going to spend an episode or two on your game before moving on. And they tend to upload regularly, so that is 24 hours to a week of publicity before your game is replaced by the next mildly interesting thing. Especially when your chapters or your game end up being shorter in playtime. But if you have lore hidden in your game, if you leave your players and audience with questions about the true story, then you can get YouTubers who will try to answer those questions to get those views. Then, to keep their new subscriber base happy, they make even more videos about your game. So you get constant publicity from these new bastions of your community without having to lift a finger. And if enough people delve deep into your game, if there's a tiny bit of narrative hidden deeper under the surface, you might just be lucky enough to receive the holy grail. A game theory video. 
For the one person in the back who may not know, Game Theory is a channel that makes videos about video games using science or in-game evidence to try and reach a conclusion. They've done everything from the theoretical history of Minecraft to determining if Nurse Joy is actually a Pokemon, but their bread and butter is horror game lore. The game doesn't even need to be a real game. Just have a horror element in a game-like form and Game Theory is ready to put together all the little details to tell you about how Grandma is actually part of some satanic mafia in Cold War Canada that secretly turned people into living snowmen in the 1980s because some entertainment mogul paid her in Bitcoin to find the secret to eternal life. And they get millions of views on pretty much every video they put out, which means your game now has an increased player base and an increase in search power, which again leads to smaller YouTubers making videos about your game to cash in on the views of your new fans. But I suspect the bonus to Game Theory's videos is the type of content they are. They're essay pieces, scripted content that takes time to make. Unlike a PewDiePie or Markiplier who is on to a new game literally the next day, Game Theory only makes one video per week at most, and these videos take time, so your game is being talked about a week or two after the initial influx of Let's Plays has passed. This helps extend that trending shelf life, just like releasing in installments. And then there's the fact it might not just be one video, maybe there's enough lore to make it a two-parter, extending it even further. And if you get that, then you can just put together a cryptic trailer for your next installment and they'll make a theory on that as well. I mean, just look at FNAF. 51 theory videos exist for this franchise and three of the security breach videos were made before the game had even come out. The newest Poppy Playtime trailer even got its own theory not too long ago. But maybe they just make videos on any good horror game. Is it really the lore that makes the difference? And for that, I point to a game by the name of At Dead of Night. At Dead of Night was this really interesting multimedia game where you tried to break out of a hotel without being caught by Jimmy, and while solving the backstory of his previous murders with the help of the hotel's ghosts. It was really well made. Lots of other YouTubers played it. It was getting millions of views. It hit all the right notes to deserve a theory. MatPat even played it on GT Live. But the game had no hidden lore. By the time you finish the game, everything is pretty much answered. All the murders are solved, you know who you are and why you were here, you even learn about Jimmy's backstory. There just wasn't anything more for a scripted series about uncovering secrets to find. Or how about Observation Duty? Fun horror game popular with YouTubers, but no hidden lore. So, no theory. But take something like Andy's Apple Farm, a basically unknown indie horror game with secrets hidden deep inside the gameplay leading to an unclear story about something dark hiding behind a colorful mascot facade. You bet your apples Matt Pat was on it like, like, like my cat on feathers. She really likes feathers. So needless to say, lore is a big key to getting on game theory and by extension, many other YouTube channels. And that isn't an inherently bad thing. Lore is really fun for both players and audiences. Building a community around solving a complex puzzle is an absolute joy. Take Inscription, for example. It's a very polished game that had enough secrets to bring together people for an ARG hidden within the game itself. That's remarkable enough, but the game was also so good on its own that it was many people's top game of 2021. The problem with lore status as the ultimate addition to any horror game is that it can overshadow all other parts of a game, until the game itself is just a vehicle to deliver lore. Let's head back to Hello Neighbor for a great example of this. It started out with very little backstory, but an impressive premise. But in Alpha 4 and the game's final release, the game had shifted focus to the neighbor's backstory. What happened to his family? What's in the basement? Who is the shadowy man who follows you and then becomes the final boss? It doesn't matter that the final boss fight is a slippery and frustrating platformer in a white void until you can finally beat the shadow man by simply standing in front of an ugly child model over and over again, because it means something. It's part of the lore, so it has to be good, right? It deserves a theory. Right, Matt Pat? Right, Matt Pat?
I feel a similar thing happened with Bendy towards the latter chapters, and it's clearly written all over Poppy Playtime's face. Lore is so influential in getting your game seen by big gaming audiences that gameplay simply doesn't matter as much. And especially in the demographic of children to young teens, it just isn't an issue for them if your game lacks any real substance because that's not the point anymore. It's a trend, it's what's popular, it's what their favorite content creators are playing, so they'll play it too. And so the cycle continues. New horror games that rely on their lore more than their game keep popping up to try to be the next big franchise maker, to have their shirts and plushies sold on Hot Topic shelves, to make a book series and a movie. They extend their release to keep themselves relevant and keep releasing new content and lore to keep the YouTube content train chugging. And all the while, their game's bugs, AI, even their main plots get left on the wayside. And worst of all, it works. And to illustrate my point, and finally end this video, I'd like to end where we began. I'd like to talk about... FNAF's security breach was the big jump. A full game with movement and objectives. A game with an actual location to explore and a new villain after the end of Afton. A game that had enough content and style to be put on consoles outside of a PC. A lot of people were excited about its release, to the point where the teaser trailer has over 10 million views. And then it was delayed. And delayed again. And then it released in December of 2021, and it was bad. Really bad. A lot of fans like to defend this title by reminding players that this isn't made by a AAA studio, or that Scott had an unexpected departure, or even that the game's flaws just made it more fun. But these are all flimsy excuses in my opinion. The game came out unfinished. Dreadfully unfinished. First and most apparent were the bugs. So many bugs. Run a showtime program which will activate the lift. And the bugs are funny when you are watching because they're unexpected and many good Let's Players are able to play off them well. But this isn't a TV show. This is a game, and that means people other than Let's Players are playing it, and no one wants to replay hours of any game just because the game glitched out before they could save. Or glitched out when you couldn't save because the developers thought it was a smart idea to hide any of their game behind a multi-hour plus wall of gameplay that required perfect execution because the save feature was permanently disabled, leading to even dedicated players using one of their other bugs against them so that they could save and make progress finding secrets that only unlock once you get past the last legit save point. Because if you wanted to experience the entirety of what the developers put together, you would have to play in one multi-hour sitting lest you lose any and all progress and have to restart at the very beginning of your search again and again and again. Refinding the same animatronic boss and then refinding every single collectible in an unending nightmarish hellscape we call a mall. The second clear indicator of Security Breach's unfinished state was the lack of content. From looking through the game's unused files, the FNAF community has found features and mini games that got scrapped closer to release. And not using every idea you come up with is just par for the course as a game developer. But with how bare Security Breach ended up being, it's very clear that it was designed to have more in it. Not to mention the lackluster quests they did implement. With an awful map and very little direction, so many people just spent their time aimlessly wandering until they bumped into their next objective, which is not good game design. And finally, we have the most unfocused part of the game. The story. You play as Gregory, a kid stuck in this mall who needs to wait until 6am to get out, or these animatronics will eat him or something. They don't explain why. Also, the security guard is after him. They don't explain that either. But that's okay, because he has the help of Freddy, who does not want to kill him because... We don't know. They don't explain it. It's fine to have some secrets in your story, everyone loves a good plot twist, but imagine not knowing anything about this franchise and this is the first game you try. 
It has no real plot. You don't know who you are. All the rules you're given for surviving seem arbitrary and forced. The big bad all the trailer showed off shows up maybe twice. And in the end, you are given obscure endings that mean nothing in the context of what you've just played. There even is a line before you escape where Gregory talks about how if he leaves, it won't stop more kids from going missing. Wh where did that come from? Like, seriously, I get that FNAF is synonymous with dead kids, but in this entire several hour game with the majority of time being filled with dialogue, not once has the game mentioned previous missing kids or hinted at an underlying plot of child murder. We're just expected to get it because it's FNAF, and there are always some missing kids, but that's not how games work. That's not even how basic narratives work. If you haven't noticed by now, I really didn't like Security Breach, and I really hated how many people were willing to give it a pass as an oopsie rather than a $40 fully released game that came out playing like 2006's Elder Scrolls Oblivion, but without any of the fun or story or quality of life features, or anything that would actually make me want to play it again, frick security breach is bad. And you want to know why it has favorable reviews despite clearly being unfinished? Because it gave fans new animatronics, new gameplay, and most importantly, new lore. That's right, Birch! This whole video is a circle! I'm a writing genius! You know what Steel Wool Studios didn't have time for? The plot, bug fixes, animating more than one ending sequence, or even their own new villain. You know what they did have time for? Hiding several glitched arcade cabinets with spooky minigames for you to win. Or how about the 16 discs hidden around the entire mall that contained cryptic therapy sessions between two characters that you listen to in a recreation of the living room from Sister Location? Or, how about a whole secret underground level that leads to an encounter with our buddy Afton in an old pizzeria that nobody wanted? They had time to develop, write, animate, and implement everything that had to do with the hidden lore, but when it came to the actual game itself, we got an unfinished, sometimes unplayable mess of half-thought-out ideas thrown together in a moderately coherent way. Because the game itself isn't a priority anymore. The game doesn't need to be good, it just needs to have that sweet, sweet lore to get YouTubers and their fanbase playing. And it did. It worked. Despite it all, it still has positive ratings. Because, and I quote, Very cool gain, I met Fetty Fackbear. I hate humanity. So what is my point? Why have you listened to a 26-year-old rant about the current state of some child-focused media for over 40 minutes? Actually, I don't know how you got this far, but you did, and I do this regularly, so you might want to leave a like and subscribe? But my actual point is this. MatPat said recently in a video that games are changing because fans keep predicting the new lore that comes next. That might be true, but I believe that ignores the bigger picture. I believe that indie horror games have started to follow trends that specifically gear themselves towards YouTube audiences in hopes that they can profit off of the younger fans and build multimedia franchises. It's no longer about the games themselves, it's about the aesthetics and how they can merchandise a cute mascot in an edgy way. It's about hiding lore, even if it makes no sense, so that their communities keep coming back no matter how poorly made the next release is. It's about keeping fans hooked so that they can keep making money. And it's probably not going to stop because everyone in the cycle profits. Everyone except you. I'm Gail, and this has been a depressing look at the current state of indie horror games. Like and subscribe, maybe hit that bell, and I will see you in another rant. Bye bye Hey dear, you uh, working on that script about indie horror games and YouTubers' effect on their development? Yeah, it's been months of long, hard research and debate, but I think I've finally settled on my script for the video.
Great. I'm so happy for you. Have you seen the latest Game Theory video? No. Uh, why? Oh, no reason. Just, uh, don't get too mad, okay? Change the original story because of it, well, then it would explain why the game was so unpolished and the lore so incomplete. By rushing to try and make something surprising, they ultimately... Hi there, it's the end of the video, my friend. Hit the bell if it was okay, I'm sure I'll make good content someday. I'll play some games or do some drawing Pokemon and fights with darling video essays and reviews. I couldn't do it without you, so thanks. Like and subscribe.